Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by RamVPN.com, the leading provider of next-generation online anonymity and VPN security solutions. Their architecture is unique, tamper-safe, and 100% guaranteed. They even accept Bitcoin. Listeners of the Organic View Radio Show can receive a 15% discount in three-month and six-month personal plans by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. On today's show, environmental engineer and scientist, Mr. Rich Andrews, will be on the show to talk about the Colorado Pesticide Applicators Act Sunset Renewal Bill. Boy, that's a mouthful. Now, the state of Colorado has been in the news once again regarding legislation that will impact applicators as well as pollinators. The Sunset Review hearing for the Pesticide Applicators Act is scheduled to take place on Wednesday, January 21st, 2015. There has been a great deal of outrage as far as how this is being handled, especially since it comes up for renewal once every 10 years. So on today's show, environmental engineer and scientist, Mr. Rich Andrews, will be on the show to talk about it and what his recommendations are. So I'd like to welcome to the show. Rich Andrews. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Mr. Andrews, could you please share with our listeners a little bit about your background? Sure. I've been in the business of environmental science and engineering for about 45 years, starting with my first real job in that field was with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency when it first started. And back when the EPA really was a, an energetic, purpose-driven organization. Subsequently, I've run my own businesses as a environmental engineering consulting since the late 80s, and most recently have become an organic farmer for about the last eight years. Could you begin by discussing the history? Could you talk about the Avendanza case and the Hotchkiss case? Sure. These two cases that June has mentioned are cases of really environmental contamination and and chemical trespass by pesticides. They both are Colorado cases. One was referred to as the Albandanza case. We probably won't give names and information otherwise, but but uh, it, it has to do with a farm that was located in eastern, northeastern Colorado. And that farm is an organic vegetable production operation uh, and a seed company producing organic seeds. They were oversprayed by a neighboring farm and the contract sprayer company more than once. And the most damaging event was was when they were oversprayed and it basically wiped out their entire crop for the year. They had to throw away all of their produce because it had been oversprayed by glyphosate and another chemical. Uh, and uh, it made the crop, of course, no longer organic, which they depended upon for their business. Um, that case was poorly managed by the Colorado Department of Agriculture, and ultimately the only resolution was by the the damaged parties, the, the Abenanza Farm, having to sue to to get some compensation. And they did settle out of court, so the exact amount of compensation was not clear but because it was not allowed to be made public. But nevertheless, the damage was so severe that basically this this excellent farm, very much a leading organic farm in our area, uh, lost their business. They, they went bankrupt. And, uh, and, and that is a sad state of affairs. The State Department of Agriculture absolutely fell down on doing their job properly and timely. So that's kind of a summary of one of them. 
The other one was on in western Colorado, uh, and this was a case of a, a company that was spraying for mosquitoes. It really wasn't a company. It was an individual that was spraying and fogging, and fogging not only his land but his neighbors. And his neighbor happened to be a chemically sensitive, very ill person. And again, the court in this case, it had to go to court because it, once again, the Colorado Department of Agriculture failed to do their job in properly enforcing uh, these kinds of, of uh, illegal applications of pesticides. Um, it had to go to court, and the court, in fact, did, in a landmark decision, uh, made the decision that this, in fact, was, was an incident of chemical trespass. And that was a kind of a new court uh, declaration calling over sprays and uh, by pesticide as, in fact, trespass. So, and once again, but that the whole process took several years to to prosecute, and and the the sad part of it is the state relicensed this same individual who failed the test several times before he was relicensed even. And in fact, the state law says he should not have been relicensed at all. So, so again, the system broke and continues to be broken here in Colorado. Who governs this legislation? Who's involved? Well, as, as it is in virtually in, across the whole country of the U.S., uh, the EPA is the top dog in pesticide regulation under the uh, the law called FIFRA, uh, which is an acronym for the Federal Insecticide Fungicide Rodenticide Act, and uh, uh, so EPA kind of you know does the primary registration of pesticides and sets the tone for or most rules and regulations associated with pesticides, including you know, packaging, labeling, and, and that sort of thing. In, in Colorado, the Colorado Department of Agriculture is, is the implementing body for the EPA's regulations under the federal law. And they implement that in a couple of, couple of laws. One is the Pesticide Applicators Act, and there are some other companion acts. One is just called the Pesticide Act. And then there's another one dealing with with uh, noxious weeds and, and several different acts. But the Pesticide Applicators Act is the, the act that is currently up for renewal uh, here in Colorado. And that only occurs every 10 years. Uh, they have what they call the sunset process. The sunset process is a mandatory process. If the state legislature does not renew an act, then that act basically disappears from the books. The just now convened 2015 legislature will, in fact, be dealing with the Pesticide Applicators Act. And, you know, what they will do with it is, of course, up to them um, and, and up to us as citizens to try and get them to do what they should do. That's a, a little bit of the history of the process, anyway. When you ask about who's who's governing things, well, I have to say the Pesticide Applicators Act in Colorado, as it is implemented, really is not governing pesticide application. It's more of a merely a mechanism to make sure that the pesticide applicators can, and the farmers and and folks involved with pesticide applications can continue to do the job. It's really not here in Colorado about public health and environmental protection, which it should be. Isn't the Pesticide Advisory Committee, doesn't it consist of, I guess, industry representatives as opposed to having a fair mix of people, including including even one beekeeper. From what I understand, there isn't even one beekeeper on this committee. That's correct. I, the Pesticide Applicators, um, or the Pesticide Advisory Committee, 
is designated under the Pesticide Applicators Act, and it, it the act dictates uh, who will be on that committee. It's a committee of 11 people, and almost all of them, with the exception of two or three out of the 11, are representatives from the pesticide industry being either applicators or formulators. Uh, there is one designated person um, that's a kind of an at-large appointee, and that person currently on the committee he doesn't really have any pesticide experience at all and uh, comes out of the pharmaceutical industry. There's one farming um, representative uh, on there, and, uh, and there's one person from the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment who's primarily there to deal with disease-transmitting insects, in other words, mostly mosquitoes and, and the rodents and things like that uh, that may transmit diseases. So there's no one, no one on the committee, really, that is even versed in public health, toxicology, environmental background, and, and there is, as you mentioned, there is no, there is no beekeeper. So, in other words, local citizens, just even local government, can't really do too much at this point because they have to take direction from the state. So, how did that happen? Well, that's another flaw in the whole process. In a previous sunset review process uh, uh, back in the mid-90s, actually, it's been 20 years ago at this point, before that, local government's did have a certain degree of control over pesticides here in Colorado. In that review process, the legislature stripped virtually all authority from local governments and said this is a matter only to be regulated by uh, and administered by the state Colorado Department of Agriculture. So the only thing that local governments can do now with respect to pesticide regulation is on their own properties that they own, um, and that's it. Uh, in other words, they, you know, even if the citizens of a city or a county wanted to have a stronger, more public health-minded control, they can't do it right now. It's totally in the hands of the state. And, uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, that, that is a very unfortunate because because the state is not doing their job, nor is EPA. It's a trickle down problem. The EPA is clearly not doing their job. They are they have they register pesticides that are known to be very toxic in a variety of uses, including the bee the, the bees and pollinators, uh, and also in public health. And so they say, okay, here here's what you put on, here's what you can put on on what crops and so forth. They pass that down to the state. The state unblinkingly just says, okay, that's what the EPA says, that's what we'll do. I only know of one instance where the state ever, in fact, did anything more severe than what EPA told them to do in, you know, in several decades. Um, wow. And uh, so, and that was just a case where it had to do with some uh, shallow groundwater contamination issue where they did, in fact, do something more more protective than EPA, but that's that's only one instance. <laughs> Otherwise, so basically the system is broken is what it boils down to, and we can't fix it at the local level right now, meaning local governments, cities, and counties. So, so what needs to happen, of course, is in this current legislature, we need to do some serious fixes. Now, whether or not we will be able to accomplish it, that's to be seen, but uh, but there are, you know, this pesticide applicators uh, committee clearly needs to be balanced so that the affected parties are represented. That means chemically sensitive people, it means children, it means uh, environmental and ecological representatives, uh, it means beekeepers, you know the people who are on the receiving end of the poisons that are being applied and the environmental, um, uh, you know, the, the species that don't have voices, uh, they need to be protected. 
right now. The, the others are just not, the ones that are on it are the people that are just in it for the buck and making a living, you know, and that's it. Mr. Andrews, could you talk about what the process is for applicators as far as education, licensing, mm-hmm. as well as any databases which incorporate any previous fines or any issues with mm-hmm. applicators in the state of Colorado? Another glaring problem with the current law is applicators are, you know, they keep records. Uh, I mean, these commercial entities that apply pesticides, they keep records of what and where and when they have applied pesticides. But they only keep them in their own files. They, you know, and they're only required right now to keep them for a period of three years, and then they can just throw them away. But it never reaches uh, a, a publicly accessible database. Uh, the state does not collect any of this information. And so the public and even scientific community are in the dark about what is going on with respect to pesticide applications in our state. What we are advocating is that that, that needs to be made totally transparent and real time. I mean, if these if these applicators are required to, in fact, collect and and record the information, well, why don't they just do it online into a state operated database that is totally publicly accessible? Right now, for example, you know, even an epidemiologist or an environmental scientist can't know what the, is going on in a particular locality, for example. So you, it's almost impossible to do an epidemiological study of, let's say, health effects, particular city or county or, or a particular watershed, um, because the data is just not there. It can't, it can't be uh, evaluated. So, so what needs to happen, of course, is set up this public database and it really could be, doesn't have to be something that you have to have a whole staff to do it. If these applicators just log on when they've made an application within 24 hours and say, okay, here's what was applied, where and when. And uh, and it happens. It just goes in and the public can instantly look at it if they want to. And I agree. It sounds as though there's definitely a need for more transparency, especially oh, more communication. Sure, absolutely. So you know that that's that's another clear thing that needs to happen, and uh, one of the other things we are definitely advocating for is is elimination and banning statewide of the neonicotinoid pesticides, which are so damaging. Uh, these class of nerve toxins that are used to to kill insects are killing all kinds of beneficial insects, including bees and all kinds of pollinators. They're also deadly to birds, other uh, orders of gamut of life forms, reptiles, uh, amphibians, fish, even we as mammals are, you know, these, these are damaging pesticides and and the EPA just lets it happen and therefore the state just lets it happen. And uh, they have become the, the number one class of insecticides uh, used in the world. Uh, We're all being exposed to these poisons, and without proper registration and review, EPA's not doing their job, state's not doing their job, and the local governments are not allowed to do their job. Mr. Andrews, what would you like to see happen as far as the shift in management? Well, at the top level, EPA is, is just not doing their job when it comes to pesticides. So, you know... Clearly, major changes in the philosophy, and if they actually even implemented the law as written, things could be a lot better, but they did not. That's one area. Now, I have lesser, oh, lesser belief that, that things are going to change dramatically at the federal level, so let's work at the state level and at local level where perhaps democracy is closer to the people. At the state level, a few of the key things I've already mentioned are making the enforcement real and protective of the public health and the environment. I'd like to see 
the neonicotinoids, in fact, banned in the state so that our environmental assets of, that we so depend upon, that the pollinators can, in fact, thrive here in the state. Um, I'd like to see transparency in, in databases so that the public and scientific communities can, can understand what's really happening to them and, and therefore lay the groundwork for better regulation at the state level, more protective legislation. I'd like to see the ability of local governments to, in fact, be able to be responsive to their particular citizenry, and right now that's prohibited. And so those are a few of the key things. And, of course, any advisory boards and bodies that, that are there ought to be representative of not the industry that's being regulated, which is the way it is now, but the people who are being affected and the environmental ecological species that, that don't have voices. They all need to be represented by us two-legged in some fashion. So those are some of the things that really need to happen. I really hope that our legislators can see that pesticides really are poison and they have to be managed very, very carefully and eliminated to the extent possible. I think that's a very important message and it'll be interesting to see what happens on Wednesday, January 21st as the Sunset Review hearing for the Pesticide Applicators Act takes place. Mr. Andrews, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been very interesting learning, especially from someone with your background, some of the recommendations as well as what's been going on. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm happy to uh, be on your program. And folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>